let's return to employment income taxation. And the principle really, before I start is, I'm going to talk to you about the amounts that are excluded from employment income taxation. Before we talk about the things that are excluded, let me mention what is included. And that is a very simple question to answer. When it comes to employment income taxation, the general rule is that all gains or profits from an employment should be included in an employment income determination unless specifically exempted. So the general rule is what? All gains or profits from an employer-employee relationship must be included in determining the accessible employment income of an employee for a year of assessment or for part of a year of assessment. Now, with this out of the way, we can also come and say, what are the things that are excluded? Because like I said, unless that item is specifically excluded, specifically exempted from being taxed under employment income taxation, then it follows that that thing should be included in determining employment income taxation. So let me tell you the things that must not be included in determining employment income taxation. And this will guide you in your exam. As you're reading the question, you'll probably be catching some of these things and know that I shouldn't be including this in accessible employment income. The first, before I even go to that, the first item is any exemption under Section 7 of Act 896. Now, Section 7 is a section that covers exempt amounts. So it's under Section 7 that you see so many exempt amounts such as, that is the same section that says the President of Ghana is exempt from income tax or the income, uh, the income of President of Ghana as President of Ghana or in the office of President of Ghana is exempt from income tax. It's that same section that says the income from cocoa of a cocoa farmer is exempt from income tax. Right? It's that same section that says a pension is exempt from income tax generally. So, Section 7 gives a list of income amounts or income items that are exempt from income tax within the laws of Ghana. So, we are saying that if an employee earns any income that is listed under Section 7, then that income is also exempt under employment income taxation. And as a result, you should not include any of the Section 7 amounts in determining an employee's employment income. The next item that is exempt or that should be excluded when you are determining an employee's employment income for the year of assessment is any final withholding payment. And I've explained this so many times that a final withholding payment is any payment that at the point of withholding fully satisfies the withholdee's tax liability with respect to that amount. An example, common example is dividend. So, dividend suffers withholding tax at the rate of 8%. That 8% withholding tax is a final tax. What it means is that when you are determining an employee's employment income, if for any reason they receive dividend as part of their employment income, which is rare because typically that would be investment income, but let's say apart from dividend, if they receive any amount that is subject to a final withholding payment, that amount should not be included in determining the employment income. Let me even give you a more practical example. You may be aware that payments made to part-time teachers, part-time lecturers, invigilators, examiners, and all of those similar categories of people will attract withholding tax at the rate of 10%. Now, that 10% withholding tax is a final tax. What it means is that if, for example, me talking to you today, I am fully employed and I teach somewhere, let's say I teach at a school as a part-time, on a part-time basis, or let's say I'm a part-time lecturer at the school. If that school pays me an amount of money for um, lecturing services rendered, because that amount they pay me will be subject to a 10% final withholding tax, when they pay me withhold 10% or keep 10% and pay to GRA, and then they pay me 90%. Now, that 90% they pay me is net of withholding taxes. I have fully discharged my obligation with respect to that amount, 
and I will not include that amount from being a lecturer or being a part-time lecturer in determining my total accessible income for the year. So that is it for final withholding payment. Because the amount has fully satisfied your tax liability for the period or for that particular amount, you do not include that amount again in determining your accessible income. So take note, and the employment income taxation, you do not include any amount that have suffered a final withholding tax. The next amount is any discharge or reimbursement of an expense incurred by an individual on behalf of the employer of that individual that serves the proper business purposes of the employer. So here, if for any reason an employer reimburses you gives you a reimbursement of any expense that you had to incur on behalf of that employer but that expense you incurred was just for proper business purposes you did it because you incurred that expenditure because it was something that business needed or whatever it related to had to do with business use so let's say you had to um spend money to go let's say transport you spend money on transportation but it was transport to go and get, let's say, goods for the business, to procure goods for the business. So when you come back and the employer reimburses you that amount you spent on transportation, because that transport was just to go get business goods to come and sell, which is a proper business purpose, that amount of what reimbursements to you, even though it's income in your hands now, we are saying that because it was a discharge or reimbursement of an expense you already incurred on behalf of your employer, that serve the proper business purpose of the employer, that amount will not be included in determining or arriving at your accessible employment income. The next amount that will not be included is any discharge or reimbursement of the dental, medical, or health insurance expenses. Take note. So it's either dental, medical, or health insurance expenses of an individual. But here, please take note, this benefit should be available to each full-time employee on equal terms. So here, for this health insurance expense that is reimbursed to you, for this medical expense, for this dental expense that is reimbursed to you, for it not to attract income tax, Everybody who is a full-time employee in that organization must enjoy this benefit equally. So it doesn't matter your grade, it doesn't matter your position, it doesn't matter your rank. Everybody, as long as they are a full-time employee, and the law is clear here, they must be full-time employees. Once they are full-time employees and they enjoy any medical benefit, so they are like, go to the hospital, go get a checkup, bring us your receipt, and we'll refund the money to you that refund will not be added to your employment income taxation on the condition that everybody in the organization who is a full-time employee will get the same benefit no discrimination this guy doesn't get a higher amount because of his rank it must be available to each full-time employee on an equal basis if there is some form of discrimination then this condition will not be met and that amount will be included in determining the employee's income taxation. So in questions, sometimes read between the lines. The examiner may want to tell you that maybe this particular benefit for medical or dental and health insurance benefit is only available to directors. It's only available to, let's say, senior managers. In that case, you need to take note that that benefit is not available to each full-time employee on an equal basis. And in that case, you would need to include that amount in determining that person's employment income for the year of assessment. What else must we exclude when it comes to employment income taxation? The next is what any payment that provides passage of the individual to or from Ghana in respect of what their first employment, right, by the employer or their termination of employment where that individual is what where that individual is recruited or engaged outside Ghana so either they are recruited or they are engaged outside Ghana that's point number one to be met the next is what 
they are in the country they are in ghana solely for the purpose of serving the employer or the final one is what they are not a resident of ghana so here essentially a payment providing passage is essentially any payment you make in terms of what getting them to ghana or getting them to leave ghana when they are done so this will include the cost of their ticket their visa any expense you need to incur to bring them down typically that would have been an unemployment benefit because if not for the fact that you pay for them to come they may have had to incur that expense themselves right so this is a gain or profit they are making from unemployment but we are saying that if they meet any of these three criteria here which is they must be recruited or engage outside ghana they mustn't be in ghana as at the time you recruited them if they are they are disqualified they must have been outside ghana when you give them the job offer the next is what they are in ghana only to serve you right so if they are coming here to do their own business and then work for you on the side they don't qualify they must be in ghana just for the sole purpose of working for you then the final is they should not be resident or they should not be tax resident of ghana if they meet these three criteria then any passage costs will not be included in determining their employment income for the year take note that if they do not meet any of these they are disqualified and that amount will be taxable as part of their accessible employment income the next is or the amount that next that is supposed to be excluded is what any provision and this is something that is, is tested very frequently especially at level two any provision of accommodation by an employer and take note of the types of um entities here so an employer carrying on a timber a mining a building a construction a farming business or petroleum operations to that person at a place or site where the field operation of the business is carried on will not be included in determining employment income so take note as we we'll talk about shortly when we get to accommodation benefits where you receive a benefit of accommodation that accommodation benefits should ordinarily be included in determining your income from employment we are saying that where your employer is engaged in timber mining building construction farming or petroleum operations and they provide accommodation for you the employee but this accommodation is on the site then in that case we will, we will not tax that amount we will not assess that accommodation benefit to tax the regulations to the income tax act that's li 2244 provided some further clarity and said that well it mustn't necessarily be on the site so for example we don't expect you if it's a gold mining company we don't expect you to live right on the site where the blasting and drilling and everything is done it must be within some reasonable proximity right so reasonable proximity taking into account things such as safety because if you live on a mine site the noise the noise pollution the dust is not safe to live in right so we look at proximity and then we consider so many other factors in concluding that indeed that accommodation qualifies as being accommodation provided on the field operations or where the field operations is carried on so where you meet this criteria this accommodation benefit will also not be subject to income tax and then the next that will not be included in determining employment income taxation is any payment made to an employee on a non-discriminatory basis right and which by reason of the size the type and the frequency of the payment it is unreasonable or administratively impracticable for the employer to account for or to allocate to an individual so here a typical example very common one in practice is where an employer provides canteen meals to employees if for any reason the nature of the meals is not anything specialized you don't get to say um you want this meal it's just a mass serving you just go there you pick anything you want to eat and you go it, the law is saying that if it's unreasonable or administratively impracticable for you to say kofi mensa adds one cd 50 pesos worth of rice today yeah it's um 40 cities worth of planting today right 
if it's unreasonable or administratively impracticable, it's burdensome to actually do the math and allocate to everybody, then we are saying we'll let that amount go because that, that amount is what is is um is going to be unreasonable to ask you to allocate to everybody. But take note the condition here is that what the it should have been made on what a non-discriminatory basis, right? So once again, the condition of it being made available equally so everyone who qualifies comes to play once again. So take, take note of this. It's quite um, very important. And finally, redundancy pay. This is any payment um, that is made to you really as a result of being made redundant. So here, if let's say there's a new technology that renders your industry or your job role um, obsolete, then because of that, you are made redundant, you are laid off. Any payment made to you on your way out because you've been made redundant will not be subject to employment income taxation, will not be included in determining your employment income taxation for the year. So take note that these are the items that the law specifically provides for that should not be included in determining employment income for the year. Why did I spend time to talk about these? These are the things, the first place the examiner will look to test you will be one of these. So if you look at every standard employment income taxation question, every single one of them, you will find somewhere within the question where they try to place at least one of these, right? So just pick any question and see. You'll find out for yourself. If they are not testing the accommodation one, they are testing the passage cost one. If they're not testing the, the passage cost one, they are testing redundancy pay. If they're not testing redundancy pay, accommodation benefit. If no accommodation benefit, then discharge or reimbursement or for dental benefit. Like every single one of these, they try to bring at least one of these to see if you know whether or not these amounts must be excluded when it comes to determining employment income and what the tax from employment income for a year of assessment. Now that you know that, let me talk about something that's quite interesting, but that lots of students don't talk about, but this is particularly relevant for level three candidates. Level two candidates, you never know, it may show up, but level three where they sometimes throw these obscure areas into the paper, please pay attention. So what must you know when it comes to non-resident public entertainers? What is the tax treatment? So this will apply to entertainers who come to Ghana. They are non-resident, right? But they come to Ghana to do something, perform a show, do some sports events, whatever it is, right? How does our law require them to be taxed? So what we need to know is that any non-resident public entertainer who renders a service in Ghana shall be treated as an employee, take note, of the promoter of the event. At the same time, a person who makes payment to a public entertainer shall be treated as the employer of that public entertainer. And the payment made shall be treated as income derived by that public entertainer from employment. So if your favorite musician comes to Ghana, if your favorite sportsman comes to Ghana, and they come to run a show, whoever brought them to Ghana, whichever promotion, promotion house, whichever um, event management company brought them to Ghana, or whoever will be making payments to them for their show or for their event they did in Ghana, will be deemed as their employer. And that public entertainer will be deemed as their employee. Take note of this. It's very, very essential. Now that we've established that public or non-resident public entertainers will be deemed by our laws to be employees who are exercised on employment in Ghana, although for a period of time, at what rate will they be taxed? They will be subject to withholding tax at the usual rate for non-resident individuals, which is the rate of 25%. So remember that non-resident public entertainers who come to Ghana to run a show will be deemed as what employees of the promoter who is running or organizing that event. Now, with this out of the way, how does our law define a public entertainer? It says any stage artist, any motion picture artist, any radio artist, any musician, any sportsman or sportswoman, including but not limited to an athlete, a footballer or a boxer, all of these guys will be deemed as public entertainers. 
So if you're a boxing fan, I'm sure you are aware that we are looking forward to getting a unified, undisputed world heavyweight champion. As it stands now, we expect Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury to fight. Now, if for any reason it will not happen, I know for sure Ghana will not be chosen. It's impossible, literally, right? But let's say for some reason, um, Matchroom Boxing and all the promoters involved decide to stage the fight in Ghana, right? If this fight is staged in Ghana, Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury will be deemed to be what? Employees in Ghana whilst they are here. And if we are apply, applying this law strictly, the promoter, whoever in Ghana went to organize the event and brought them here and everything, will be deemed as their employer. And whatever they earn from Ghana within that period will be subject to what? A 25% income tax. However, take note that depending on their country, which is UK, so um, Tyson Fury and AJ are both what? UK resident persons. Ghana has a double taxation agreement with the UK. So even though they may pay some tax here, and UK may seek to tax them on their foreign earnings because of the worldwide taxation rule that UK uses, similar to Ghana, they will get some benefits by way of what? A foreign tax credit when they go to the UK. This is because of what? The double taxation agreement Ghana has with the UK. Take note, however, let me make a disclaimer, that this is a very simplistic, high-level explanation of this scenario. Should they actually come to Ghana to fight, the nuances or the specifics of their contract, the specifics of the time they are here, how their contract is structured and whatever clauses they may have may vary this treatment. So this is not um, a straitjacket approach, hands down, whatever it is. This is what you can apply at face value, but specifics may vary the treatment slightly. So take note, for non-resident public entertainers, this is the proposed tax treatment according to the tax laws of Ghana. Now that we know this, let's look at the treatment for overtime payments. Take note, like I said at the beginning, this session is to make sure that by the time you are done, you will have a refresher. You remember, okay, this was that. Oh, this rate was that, right? So this is supposed to bring everything, consolidate all the key areas you must remember when it comes to employment income taxation. And I'm taking them one after the other. Another thing you cannot write a tax exam without knowing is how to tax overtime payments. It's impossible. You must know how to tax or treat overtime payments before you sit any tax exam. So what is the tax treatment for overtime payments? Under overtime payment taxation, we are seeing where an employer makes a payment for overtime work to someone called a qualifying junior employee. And let's emphasize that. And if you check our playlist um, under the solved pass exam question library, there is one video as of right now. We'll add more in the coming days. Um, there's one video there right now on employment income taxation solved pass exam question where we took, I think it was last two sittings, right? A question that came on over time and we solved based on different scenarios, right? If you do have time after this, take a look at that. It's a fully solved exam question on overtime payments, right? It will teach you how we apply the law. But for now, let's look at what you must know. What principle must you take away from here? What we are saying here is that if you make payment to someone called a qualifying junior employee, which I'll define shortly, what must you do? The employer should withhold tax from the total of that payment at the rate of 5% if the amount paid does not exceed 50% of the basic salary of that employee for the month. So if an employer makes an overtime payment to someone called a qualifying junior employee and that payment does not exceed 50% of the basic salary of that employee for the month, then the employer shall withhold what 5% from that amount. This 5% is a final tax. Take note, it's a final tax tax right so it fully satisfies the employee's tax liability with respect to this overtime amount right what's the second scenario the employer shall withhold tax from the excess of that payment at the rate of what 10 percent if the amount paid exceeds 50 percent so if it exceeds 50 percent 
of the basic salary of the employee for the month, then the employer would hold what um ten percent of that amount. So what do I mean here? Let me try to simplify this for you. If an employer makes a payment to an employee for overtime, first thing you need to check is is this employee a qualifying junior employee in the first place? If yes, these rules will apply. If no, don't waste your time because all of this will not apply. Take note of that. First thing you need to ask yourself is, is the payment being made to a qualifying junior employee? I'll define that shortly. Don't worry. If yes, then these rules will apply. If no, the rules will not apply. So let's, let's look at the rules again. The employer will withhold at the rate of 5% if the amount of overtime paid does not exceed 50% of the basic salary of the employer. Like I said, we have a fully solved exam question on this particular um, concept. So take a look at that, right? Or if the amount does exceed 50% of the basic salary, then the excess above 50%, you withhold at 10%. So it means if you are paying over time, ask yourself, what's the employee's basic salary? Let's say it is 1,000 CDs. Let's use numbers. The employee's basic salary is what? 1,000 CDs. You pay an overtime of what? 400 CDs. So this is scenario one. And as scenario one, basic salary of 1,000, you pay overtime of 400 CDs. In this particular case, you can see 400 CDs is less than what? 50% of the basic salary, which will be what? 500. So because it is what? Less than 50%. Take note here. We are saying that what? If the amount does not exceed 50%, of the basic salary, then you withhold that whole 5%. So it means this 400 CDs will attract 5% withholding tax and it's, that's it, right? However, let's say scenario two, instead of paying 400, the employee, the employer paid what? Let's say 700. This 700 clearly exceeds 50% of what? 1,000 CDs. It's now 70%. We are saying that you withhold tax from the excess of that payment at 10%. So here, the first 50%, which will be 500 CDs, will attract 5%. Then the extra above that, which is what, 200 CDs, will now attract what, 10%. So it is the excess above the 50% threshold that will what, attract the tax of what, 10%. Take note of this. This is the rule when it comes to what, overtime payment. Now, we are saying that in the case, so what we just did that was what, when it is paid to a qualifying junior employee, what if it is not paid to a qualifying junior employee? We are saying where an employer makes a payment for overtime to an employee who is not a qualifying junior employee, the payment shall be included in calculating the income of that employee from the employment and tax in accordance with the Fair Schedule of Act 896. The Fair Schedule is the schedule of the income tax either provides all your tax rates, right? That same schedule in the first paragraph of that schedule gives you what people popularly call what the graduated tax rate or the graduated tax table, right? So we are saying that over time payments that are made to people who are not qualifying junior employees will be taxed normally as if it's any other employment income. So take note, the condition you must meet first is that a person must be a qualifying junior employee for this rule to hold. But who is a qualifying junior employee? First is... The employee must be a junior staff member. That's number one. They must be a junior staff member. Apart from this, the next is that their qualifying employment income for the year should not exceed 18,000 CDs. Take note, first criteria is that they should be a junior staff member. So the past question that I spoke about, the question mentioned clearly that the person was a senior staff member. Because of that, it did not apply to them and we had to tax them normally using a graduated or the personal income tax rate. However, um, so in that case, I think they were a senior staff member, but they met the monetary threshold of what 18,000 CDs here. So they're trying to trick you. You must meet both. You must be a junior staff member and at the same time, your qualified employment income must not exceed 18,000. And this comes to roughly... 1,500 Ghana CDs per month, right? So if you're qualified employment income, if you want to know whether your overtime will be taxed at this special rate, ask yourself, is your qualified employment income 1,500 Ghana CDs or less per month? In that case, you will qualify. So take note, the figure is what? 18,000 Ghana CDs per annum. 
and the person must be a junior staff member for this to apply. That is the rule for overtime payments. How do we treat bonus payments? Another very popular um, one for exams. The tax treatment for bonus payments is different from overtime. So when an employer pays a bonus to an employee during a year of assessment, the employer shall, if the total of the bonus payment made by that employer to the employee during the year of assessment does not exceed 15% of, please take note of this, this is what annual basic salary, people mix it up. Overtime is not annual, monthly will suffice. But bonus, your comparison should be made to the person's annual for all the 12 months, their annual basic salary, right? So if the total of the bonus payment made by that employer to the employee during the year of assessment does not exceed 15% of the annual basic salary of that employee, you need to withhold tax from the gross amount at the rate of 5%. All right? So... If you make payments to an employee and it's a bonus payment and the payment does not exceed 15% of their annual basic salary, then you withhold from that amount at the rate of what? 5%. However, if the total of the bonus payment made by the employer during the year exceeds 15% of the basic salary of the employee, what will you do? You will add the excess payment to the employment income of that employee and you withhold tax from it in accordance with the fair share. So once again, you apply the personal income tax rate, the one that starts with the first figure and ends with what? An exceeding figure at 30%, that table, right? So here, to summarize bonus payment or the tax treatment of bonus payment, first thing you need to do is determine 15% of the employee's annual basic salary. Next step is compare this 15% amount to the bonus payment made. If the amount is less, if the bonus payment amount is less than 15% of the annual basic salary, withhold from the whole amount at a rate of 5%, simple. However, if the bonus amount or the bonus payment made exceeds 15% of the annual basic salary, then you withhold from the 15% portion at 5%, then the excess above 15% will be added back to the employees employment income and tax as part of their other income and from employment so this is it for bonus payments now that we have bonus two out of the way let's look at some benefits that have been specifically quantified under the income tax act the first one we need to know is motor vehicle benefit so this is where a company provides an employee with a motor vehicle they give them a car to use for their day-to-day -day activities. In this particular instance, how will the motor vehicle benefit be assessed? How will the employee be taxed when it comes to motor vehicle benefit? And take note for this, the examiner does not provide this risk to you in the exam. So this is one thing you must actually memorize if you already haven't. I'm sure everybody here already knows this, but if you don't, it's fine. If you have motor vehicle benefits, these are the rates. If you are given... A driver, you are given vehicle, you are provided with fuel, then 12.5% of your total cash emolument will be the amount of motor vehicle benefits. But hold on, this will be restricted or limited to what? 600 Ghana CDs per month. So technically, what we are saying here is we'll pick what? The lower of the two. So total cash emolument is essentially what? A summation of all benefits paid to you in cash as part of what your employment um, contract. Now we pick what 12.5% of that total cash emolument and compare it to 600 Ghana CDs. That's if you are doing monthly computation. If it's annual, you multiply by 12, right? We pick the lower, i.e. the amount of what motor vehicle benefit for anyone who has a driver, a vehicle plus fuel would not exceed 600 Ghana CDs per month. We try to cap it so we don't overtax people. The next is if you are given vehicle and fuel but no driver. In this case, instead of 12.5%, it drops to what 10% of total cash emolument, and the 600 Ghana CD drops to what 500 Ghana CDs per month as the maximum permiss permissible limit. Right? The next is if you are given a vehicle only here, no driver, no fuel. 
here the ratio or proportion of total cash emolument drops further to five percent of total cash emolument and we have the 500 cd so we divided by two really into half so it becomes 250 cds per month in terms of what the limit that will be applied to the payment now what if you are given only fuel so if you are provided with only fuel then it is the same as what given or being provided with only vehicle so here once again five percent of total cash emolument up to a maximum of 250 ghana cds per month so please for this memorize it find a way to keep it in your way or commit it to memory you must know this it is never provided in the exam so if you are now sitting tax for the first time that's a level two guys please know this is something that you must memorize if you are given driver vehicle and fuel if you're given vehicle with fuel or you're given only a vehicle or only fuel and the question will tell you right they'll tell you as part of his employment he was provided with abc or provided with a driver and a vehicle or provided with a fully um full old vehicle whatever right but just take note that you need to know um these amounts specifically right the next benefit we need to know obviously will be what accommodation benefits this is where your employer provides you with accommodation and before i continue remember i told you when we started and that the amount that should be excluded that any accommodation provided on what some specific sites examples include what farming business mining building construction and petroleum all of those guys right will be excluded so take note in as much as we have this table to guide us if the benefit is provided on that site then the tax will not apply Despite this, take note that the law is clear. If you are given a cash benefit for you to go and rent your own accommodation, we don't care whether it's a mining company, a farming company, whatever. It is a benefit in cash and you'll be taxed. So take note, these quantifications apply to what? Benefits in kind. When you are given the actual accommodation, physical property to go and live in, as opposed to being given cash to go and find your own place. So specifically, what we need to know is if you are provided a fully furnished accommodation so accommodation with furnishing then the benefit here will be 10 percent of your total cash emolument then take note here the amount is not restricted take note the amount is not restricted the next is if you are given only accommodation so this time accommodation without furnishing so it's not a furnished apartment in that case it is 7.5 percent of total cash emolument you can see here there's no restriction or maximum of 600 or 500 as we had with motor vehicle. Take note, these ones are just straight figures when it comes to total cash emolument. If you are given furnishing only, right, then in this particular case, it becomes what 2.5% of total cash emolument. If you are given a shared accommodation, maybe like a shared apartment with your colleague or whatever, then a shared accommodation, it's what 2.5% of total cash emolument. So please take note for accommodation benefits. This is another thing you need to commit to memory, right? So with this out of the way, let us continue with the benefits under employment income taxation. Next that we'll look at is loan benefits. But before we continue, let us refresh our understanding. Let's refresh. Let's test our knowledge. I want all of us to be involved. I want all of us to participate in this. I will ask a few questions and let's all jump into the live chat and type our response. It's very simple. Something I just spoke about. Let's see how much we remember. So I'm going to ask us. So before you type your answer, just type the question in addition, right? So I'm going to ask you the rate applicable. So first question one. Question one will be if you are given driver plus vehicle plus fuel what is the limit so limited to what on a monthly basis right is it a is it a 700 cities is it b 500 Ghana CDs or is it C 600 CDs so just type 1A or 1B or 1C 
The question is, if you are given a driver with a vehicle and fuel, what is the monthly limit? What are you limited to on a monthly basis? Is this 700 CDs? Is it 500 CDs for B? Or is this 600 CDs for C? So please let's type 1A, 1B, or 1C. Let's all do it. 1A, 1B, 1C. What do you think the answer is? Let's, let's all take our time to do it. Yeah, keep the answers coming. Is it 1A, 1B, or 1C? When you're given driver and vehicle and fuel. Okay, so the correct answer, I'm sure all of us know, is what C, that is what 600 Ghana CDs. Right, 600 Ghana CDs. All right, let's do another one. Another question. So the next one, let's do it this way. So if an employee is given what vehicle only, then the benefit is what dash percent of total cash emolument. So here I'm not going to give you multiple choice options. Please type the percentage. Just type in the percentage. Just type if you think it's um 30%, just type two and then what 30% in the comments or two and 30, right? What do you think the percentage is for the second one? If they are given vehicle only, forget about the monthly limit. What is the percentage? Just type your percentage two, the number two, and then your percentage, right? Let me know you are referring to the second question. Please, let's all take part. Type it in the live chat um, section or under the comments box proper. Anyone you want to use, feel free to do that. Let's all type. So yeah, keep your answers coming. If you are given vehicle only, what percentage of total cash emolument is the benefits? Just type your answer, vehicle only. All right, then let's take one last one. What happens in a case where an employee is provided? Let's let's look at the ones that are under um, which one? Let's do the ones that are under accommodation benefits. So let's even take a random one. So let me see which one do I want to even test you on. Uh, let's say you're given accommodation, accommodation only, right? It is dash percent of total cash emolument. So please type the percentage. Accommodation only. Well, I didn't give you the answer for the vehicle only, right? So vehicle only, the answer is yes. All those who said 5%, you are right. So 5% of total cash emolument is for vehicle only, right? Up to a maximum of what? 250 Ghana CDs per month. Let's come back to accommodation only. Accommodation only, what is the um, percentage of total cash emolument that is subject to, to tax, right? So just type the number three and then your answer. So if you think it's 40%, you type three and then 40% or three and 40, right, in the live chat stream, right? So please, um, accommodation only, what do you think it is? Accommodation only. When you are given accommodation without finishing, what's the percentage? All right, all those who said 7.5% of total cash emoluments, that is 7.5% of total cash emoluments, you are right for accommodation only, right? So that is it for accommodation only, right? So with that out of the way, let's come back to loan benefits. This is where an employer gives an employee a loan. And that loan is at below market interest rates. So let's say, I'm sure you've heard of your friends who work at banks. They say, okay, one benefit of working at a bank is that what? You get interest rates or you get loans at very low interest rates. I hear some banks even do 1%, 2%, some even do zero. Like I've heard, there are rumors, right? So it means you take a, a loan from your employer and you don't pay interest, right? That's a, a pure benefit. Because if you are not working for that bank and you went for that loan from a commercial bank, on commercial basis, you'd have, you have, you'd have paid interest, right? So what we are required to do here is that we need to find a way to assess employees to loan benefits where they are supposed to suffer these benefits. But there are exemptions from this, just to be fair. So what do you need to know under this? If a loan is from an employer to an employee, condition number one, if the term of the loan does not exceed 12 months, condition number two. And if the aggregate amount of the loan 
and any similar loan outstanding at any time during the previous 12 months does not exceed three months basic salary. If all of these conditions are met, then the quantity of the payment is nil. That means no loan benefit will be assessed to tax. So for a loan given by an employer to an employee to not attract tax in the hands of the employee as income tax, then number one, the loan should be from an employer or should be from the employer to the employee. Second, is that the term of the loan should not exceed 12 months. And third, the aggregate amount of the loan and any similar loan outstanding at any time during the previous 12 months should not exceed the employee's three months basis salary. So if we take the current loan balance they have and any loan they have not paid off yet, if we add the two together within any 12 month period, the previous 12 months, that summation should not exceed the employee's three months basic salary. If you meet all of these, then the quantity or the amount to be paid as loan or tax on the loan will be what? Will be nil. No amount will be assessed to tax. If you fill any of these criteria, then we'll assess some portion of that amount towards tax. What is the rule? If you do not meet any of these, then one quarter of the amount by which if interest were payable under the loan at the statutory rate for the year of assessment, the interest that would have been paid by the payee during the year of assessment in which the payment is made exceeds what? The interest paid by the payee during the year of assessment under the loan, if any. Don't worry, I'll give you an equation or a formula to simplify this. But how does the law define statutory rate? It's clear that the statutory rate here should be the Bank of Ghana rediscount rate. So how do you assess this? Take note, we are saying it's the quarter, one quarter of the amount by which if interest were payable under the loan at the statutory rate for the year of assessment, the interest that would have been paid by the payee during the year of assessment in which the payment is made, that payment, the extent to which it exceeds the interest actually paid by the employee during the year of assessment under the loan, if any. So to summarize, the loan benefit payable, let me give you an equation. So loan benefit will be 1 over 4 times what? In fact, I need some more space, okay? 1 over 4 times what? Any interest that is payable. So interest payable minus interest paid that's all right so interest payable is if you were to use the bank of ghana read this country it's right here what interest would the employee have paid take that figure let's say it's thousand cities then if them if the interest he actually paid because of the low interest rate is let's say 100 cities then the difference between these two multiplied by one over four and that is the loan benefits to be assessed so the formula you need to remember is one over four times into brackets interest that should have been paid if we use the bank of ghana what we discount rate minus interest actually paid so it means for employees who have what zero interest um, loans then this will what this figure will be what zero right so take note of this it's a simple equation one quarter of what the difference between interest that should have properly been paid minus interest actually paid if any and that would be what the loan benefits to be added to the employment income and tax. Take note that that will only apply if what the employer doesn't meet condition one, two, and what three as we have it here, right? So this is it for loan benefits under employment income taxation. What else must we know? Let's talk about personal reliefs. Personal reliefs are... Um, entitlement employees get as part of what being individual so it's not just for employment sake even individuals are, are entitled to these personal reliefs and the law is clear non-residents are not entitled to any of these personal reliefs now let me mention here that the personal reliefs have changed i've um, had a number of students asking me um, whether they are seeing right or whether what they have seen somewhere is wrong 
Let me clear the air today. Their personal reliefs have changed. And they changed effective 1st January 2020. So effective what? 1st January 2020. How did they change? How did the change come about? There was an act of parliament, which is what? Act 1007 of what? Of 2019. This amendment act came to amend the Income Tax Act, Act 896. So, those who are aware, the fifth shadow, the fifth shadow of Act 896 is what provides for personal reliefs, right? So, Act 1007 of 2019 came to amend the fifth shadow to change the rate. So, those who are using the old rates, please take note, the rates have changed. And what I'm going to mention now should be what you should use for your exam going forward. Do not so just watch this and see if what you are using is the old one if not if it is then you need to what, use this rate so for a person who has a dependent spouse or at least two dependent children or what some people popularly call the marriage or responsibility relief what is the relief that you should know effective first january 2020 this is what an amount of what 1200 ghana cities this is the relief per annum for the whole year for anyone who has a dependent spouse or at least two dependent children. The next is for disabled persons. So anybody who has a disability, they get a relief of 25% of their accessible income. But this only applies to what their business income and their employment income. It doesn't apply to their investment income. This is the only one that did not change from the old um, law. So if you know your 25% from the old um, one, then you are safe. But take note here that the disability relief is 25% of accessible income. It is not a flat figure like the other reliefs are. The next relief is the old age relief. This applies where you yourself, you are 60 years of age or above. In that case, you're entitled to a relief of 1,500 Ghana CDs for the whole year of a 12-month period. The next relief is child education relief. One thing examiners want to test in every single exam question on employment income. I don't know why. One of their favorites. Where they tell you that the, um, the person has two children, one is in school, one is abroad, whatever, right? But child education relief, the relief is what? An amount of 600 Ghana CDs per child or ward, right? But you have up to a maximum of three children or wards to cover, right? But they must be in recognized, registered educational institutions in Ghana, right? So number one, is it registered or recognized by the appropriate body? Is it GES or whoever the body is or the Ministry of Education? The next is the school must be in Ghana. So if you have children schooling outside Ghana, they don't, they don't get this benefit. But the question is, if you can afford to take a child outside Ghana, what are you using 600 CDs for? That was just by the way, but, but that's, that's the case, right? They must be in schools in Ghana, and those schools must be recognized and registered educational institutions. The next relief is the aged dependent relief. This is where you are taking care of a dependent who is greater or older than 60 years of age. So 60 years of age and above. What is the relief you get? You get a relief of 1,000 Ghana CDs for the whole year, but it is what? Up to a maximum of two dependents. You can claim for your grandpa, your grandma, or anybody above 60 you are taking care of who is a relative that they, they depend on you for their necessities of life. The next relief is the training relief. Now, this relief, you are entitled to an amount of 2,000 Ghana CDs for the whole year. The law is kind of clear. This doesn't cover academic programs or programs that lead to what, obtaining a degree. So if you go and do a degree, a first degree, a master's degree, a PhD program, you do not get this relief. It should be for what? Programs or trainings that improve your professional or vocational or technical skills and abilities. So if you do a, a short course training program, that does not lead to the award of a degree, but it makes you better at your job. It gives you better technical ability. It gives you technique and better by vocational ability, then you're entitled to this 2,000 Ghana CD um, relief when it comes to training, 
right? Take note of this. Then, how does the law define a dependent? I mentioned this in passing a few seconds ago, but a dependent is what? Anyone to whom you are providing the necessities of life. Any such person will qualify as a dependent. Question is, what are the necessities of life? The law does not define necessities of life, so it's open to interpretation. But my best guess would be what? Things like food, clothing, shelter, basic things that you need to live life or things that you can find at the base level of what Abraham Maslow's um, is it hierarchy of needs. Yeah, that thing we learned in school. That one, those are the necessities of life. Before we move on, this is not a personal relief per se, but let me mention it. It's called a mortgage interest deduction, right? Many students are not aware it exists. Those who were here on day one during the updates, I gave a very important update regarding mortgage interest deduction, regarding the court case. So please, if you haven't watched or if you were not here during the first day, please go check that out. Day one of the crash course series. Mortgage interest deduction is simply where you are allowed to deduct any mortgage interest you incur on what? Any mortgage, any borrowing you went for to acquire or construct your primary residence. The law allows you to deduct this, but it must be what you are entitled to this on one residential premises for your entire lifetime. So you need to choose your house carefully. Don't just choose any house in any area. Once you choose, you cannot change. You are entitled to what? The mortgage interest deduction on one residential premises for your entire lifetime. That is what the law provides for. So these are our personal relief. But I've said the mortgage interest deduction is not a relief per se. It's a proper deduction, right? But I placed it here for ease of what explanation. These are our personal reliefs. What about the rules around casual workers and temporary workers? How, what are the technical um, items you need to know here? What are the rules that you need to be aware of as you set your exam? So the tax treatment of casual workers and temporary workers is important to know because I've seen it spring up in a number of what exam questions in recent times. So casual workers are subject to what tax at a rate of 5% and this 5% tax is a final tax, right? So every casual worker is subject to what? income tax at the rate of five percent and this tax is a final tax but how does the law define a casual worker the legislative instrument or the regulation to the income tax act at 896 that is what li 2244 of 2016 does not define casual workers but it relies on the labor act to define what casual workers so the labor act of 2003 act 651 defines a casual worker to be any worker who is engaged on work which is seasonal or intermittent and not for a continuous period of more than six months and whose remuneration is calculated on a daily basis so if you meet this criteria you are a casual worker and your payment will be subject to tax at the rate of five percent and it's final you do not suffer any other obligation with respect to this amount how about temporary workers? For temporary workers, they are taxed under section 114 of the Income Tax Act. If you don't know what it is, the heading of that section is what? Withholding by employer. And that is what mandates employers to withhold when making payments to employees. At what rate? The rate provided for in the fair schedule was the rate what people call the graduated tax rate. So it means the temporary worker will not be subject to tax at 5%. No they will be subject to tax in the ordinary way that every other resident individual will be subject to tax, which is for the tax table that you are all aware of. So please take note, temporary workers and casual workers are not taxed the same. If you want to remember, just know the casual guy is a guy who gets 5%, right? And that will help you remember. How do we define temporary workers? Similar to casual workers, we rely on the Labor Act to define who a temporary worker is right so i say a temporary worker is any worker who is employed for a continuous period of not less than one month and is not a permanent worker or employed for a work that is what seasonal in character so these are the defining characteristics of what a temporary worker now that we know who a temporary worker and the casual worker is 
what are the tax rates you need to know effective January 2020 to date? So this is what you need to learn with respect to what tax rates. So since 1st January 2020, this is what you should use. The first 3,800, and please take note, these are annual rates. If you want the monthly, you can divide by 12. The law provides for annual rates. It is just for convenience that people divide by 12 to get a monthly. But the exam will even give you an, an annual rate anyway. So this is what you need to know. The first 3,828 cities is tax-free. The next 1,200 is at 5%. The next 1,440 is at 10%. The next 36,000 is 17.5%. The next 197,532 is at 25% and exceeding 240,000 is at 30%. So when I kept saying graduated tax rate or tax table or personal income tax rate, this is what I was referring to. Okay, how about non-residents? Non-residents are subject to what? A flat income tax rate of 25%, right? So non-residents do not go through this hassle. They just have a flat rate of 25%. So, let's look at a few exam questions that I want to highlight. We're not going to solve, per se, full question. Let's highlight some areas based on popular um, demand, popular requests. People have specifically asked this particular one I'm going to do. So, let me highlight it here, and then we can move on. It is on something called a salary scale. I've had so many questions on, can I explain how to interpret a salary scale? So, let's take an exam question. This was from November 2012. And this is what I think the, that's what most recent one I've seen um, something on this. In recent times, they don't really, I don't know. So um, you can see here, they mentioned something like, let me, let me bring the full question up. So here, you can see something like, Charles Bound was appointed as farm manager of Trop Tropical Fruits Limited on 1st April 2011 with a salary scale of what? 30,000 CDs. So I'm going to say X or times 6,000 minus 48,000 per. And what does this mean? If you want to interpret this, what I'll tell you is what? The format is A times B minus C. A is what? Starting salary. B is annual increment. Or periodic increment it depends on the question so annual or periodic increment and c is maximum salary level so for every grade right so maybe every organization has a number of grades maybe grade one or junior associate become associate senior associate whatever the grades are right you start with a certain base salary that is the a that base salary will increase by a certain amount every year. That is the B. So the A is what? The A here is a starting of base salary. The B is what? The annual increment. How much to increase by every year or every period, depending on the organization. And then the C will be what? The maximum amount it will reach. That it will stay there until what? They revise a person's grade or band. So let's interpret this. It means... Mr. Charles Barr right here will start with a salary of 30,000 CDs. Every year, it will go up by an extra 6,000. So in year one, it will be what? 30,000. Year two, 36 in that order, right? And then he will stop at 48,000 until his, what, his grade changes. So let's lay this out. Let's use what numbers. So with the same example, he will have what year one he'll have thirty thousand right year two he'll have what thirty six thousand because to go up by what six year three he'll have what forty two thousand and then year four it will increase by another six thousand you have what forty eight thousand so you can see that with this salary scale Mr. Charles Ban will what have four years to hit the maximum. If after this fourth year he is not promoted or his grade or his rank is not changed, he will stay at that 48,000 until he's promoted or until they revise the salary band. So all it means is what A is the starting salary, 
B is the annual increment and C is what the maximum it will reach before it is what revised. So in this particular example, how will we treat Mr. Charles Barnes um, scenario? They are saying required as well. They are saying compute his chargeable income for the 2011 year of assessment and then provide comments on all that. We are not doing the full question. We've taken an extract, right? So here, he started on 1st April 2011. So what will his basic salary be? For the 2011 year of assessment, don't forget that for an individual, their year of assessment is the calendar year, which is the same as their basis period, which is what? The calendar year of January to December. So since he started in April, how many months in the year was he employed? Take out January, February, March, and you have what? 9 out of 12. So in the 2011 year of assessment, please take note, his basic salary will be 9 over 12 times what? 30,000, right? So it becomes 9 over 12 times 30,000, and that will give you 22,500. So this is the amount that you use as what um, Charles Bear's um, salary for the 2011 year of assessment. Take note of this. That's the amount that will be used for that particular period. So this will be his basic salary for the year. Take note, we have to apportion because he started on what? 1st April, right? So this is the thing around salary skill. It's nothing complicated, nothing you should worry ahead over. It's quite very, very easy to understand. All right, what else must we know? Still on the past exam question. Um, another thing we've also been asked quite often is around insurance reliefs and night duty allowance. So I took this from what the May 2013 um, exam sitting. What is here that you need to be aware of? So here, let's take um, a recent one. This one here says um, Kofikuma retired from the Ghana Police Service in 2010 at a compulsory age of 60 years. In January 2011, he was employed as Chief Security Officer at Kabidi Rural Bank on a salary of what 18,000 cities a year. The bank has a provident fund to which all employees contributed 5% of their basic salary. No stress, no sweat here. But watch this. He received the following allowances. What I want you to take, take note of is um, this one here. Night duty allowance. Under Act 592. So under Act 592. A night duty allowance that was paid to a person who was a night shift employee where the amount involved did not exceed 50% of their monthly basic salary was exempt from income tax. But that was under the repealed Internal Revenue Act of 2005-92. Under Act 896, we don't have any such exemption. I did not even mention it when we started, right? So, if you see a night duty allowance in your question, please include it. Right? Do not mix this up with the old law. I don't know. The law has changed since 2015, effective 2016, but people are still confusing this. Please take note. Nice duty allowance is now taxable. It is not exempt. It's changed long, long ago. So I don't know where... Um, those who are asking me, I don't know where the confusion was coming from. Please, there's no confusion with respect to this. Then this one is also another common one. I wonder why people are still... I think it has to do with... Um, because it appears in so many past questions... And because some textbooks still field this particular question or this particular concept. So here you can see something on what insurance relief. So look at the question here. He said the man has two life what? Give me a second. He has two life assurance policies, which will mature in 2017. The first is with CSI insurance. The sum assured is 25,000. Annual premium is 1,200. The second is with what? Dead wall assurance. Some are sure this 20,000 annual premium is to it. In Act 592, once again, the Repealed Internal Revenue Act, that act provided for what? Some employment relief when it had to do with insurance. So there was some computation around the some assured and what insurance premium to give you some relief from employment. That is not in the current Income Tax Act. So I don't know if you've, you've realized. But recent ICA questions have stopped testing this. And it's only because what? It's no longer in the law. So please, if you are 
study the past question and its solution remember that when you get here this provision does not exist in the law anymore don't bother your head learning how to do it because it is not a provision in our laws again right and please like i always say if you're using a textbook make sure it's up to date right if you still have this in there it tells you how old the book is and you should stay away run away from that book with all your life right with all the, the strength you can master right so that is it for um these two exam questions if you have any questions as always please feel free to leave them in the comments now let's move to social security and pensions now this is an an area that is a must to know right you must have a good appreciation of these um concepts these principles under pensions social security the three tier system in ghana and all of that right so let's run through these as we um finalize um discussions and then we look at let's say a few questions here and then some best practice on the exam so under the three tier scheme what are the essential things you must know Number one is that we have a three-tier scheme and tier one is a mandatory basic national social security scheme that is managed by SNIT, which is the Social Security and National Insurance Trust. So tier one is a mandatory basic national social security scheme that is managed by SNIT. Tier two is a mandatory fully funded and privately managed occupational pension scheme it's a mandatory fully funded and privately managed occupational pension scheme what do i mean here so tier one is mandatory tier two is also what mandatory tier one is a basic national social security scheme that SNIT manages tier two it's also mandatory, but it's fully funded and privately managed by what? Um, pension funds or pension trustees, right? How about tier three? Tier three is not mandatory, it's voluntary. So tier three is a voluntary, fully funded and privately managed what? Provident and personal pension scheme. So unlike tier one and tier two, which are both mandatory, Tier 3 is voluntary. So take note, Tier 1, Tier 2, and what Tier 3. These are the um, pension schemes we have within the system in Ghana. What are the contribution splits? How much must an employer and an employee contribute to SNIT? So, the employer will first of all deduct 5.5% of the employee's basic salary. So that's the first step. The employer will deduct 5.5%, right? The employer deducts 5.5% from the employee's basic salary. What happens next? The employer will then add 13%, right? who add 13% of the worker's basic salary as a matching contribution. So, the employer deducts 5.5% of the employee's basic salary. So, this will be from the employee's pocket. Or, the employer, when paying the employee, will deduct this amount. So, the employee will not get this 5.5%. Then, the employer will use their own money, their own money to fund what? A matching contribution of 13%. You can see this will give you a total of 18.5%. Agreed? So this total of 18.5% of the workers' basic salary is paid as what? Social security contributions for the worker. So to summarize, it's split into two. 5.5% will come from who? The employee's pocket, i.e. his salary he should have taken home. We take 5.5% of that and then we put it aside as pension then 13% will be funded by the employer. The employer uses their own funds to contribute. So take note, employee contributes 5.5% and the employer will contribute what? 13%. So 5.5 from employee, 13 from empl employer gives you what? 18.5%.
how is this 18.5 percent distributed after the contribution has been made okay so out of the total of 18.5 percent total contribution 13.5 percent is paid to snit that's the social security and national insurance trust then five percent is paid to a private fund manager Take note, I'm talking here about the mandatory schemes, that is tier 1 and tier 2, right? So 5% is paid to a private fund manager of the employer's choice. This is the second tier. Out of the 13.5% paid to SNIT, don't forget I said that what? Here, we pay 13.5% to who? To SNIT, right? So out of that 13.5%, what happens? They are saying that SNIT will pay... 2.5% to the National Health Insurance Authority, that's the NHI, to what? For the purpose of what? Financing health insurance in Ghana. Then the remaining 11% is managed by SNIT to pay monthly pensions. All right. So to summarize, I'm saying that out of the 18.5% total, this 25 and this what 11 percent is paid to who snit and then what happens after that i'm saying that out of the what um 13.5 percent paid to snit snit will pay what 2.5 percent to the national health insurance authority for the purpose of what health insurance management in ghana and then SNIT will keep 11%. So SNIT will what, keep this 11% to pay monthly pensions. Don't forget I said at the beginning that what out of the 18.5 um, total, what will happen? The 5% amount will pay to what, a private fund manager under the second tier. So this is how the contributions are distributed after um contributed by the employer and employee so to summarize snit 11 percent to pay monthly pension second tier fund manager five percent to manage the tier two and then national health insurance authority will receive 2.5 percent for the purpose of what funding health insurance in ghana okay now let's talk about the benefits under tier one if someone is registered under tier one what benefits do they get if you're under tier one, the first thing you get is something called a superannuation pension. Now, this is essentially what is paid to a member who has met the minimum requirement of what contributing for at least 180 months. That translates to what at least 15 years of contribution in aggregate. If you meet this, you'll be paid with a superannuation pension. That's what your pension benefits you receive periodically. Here, if you retire at the age of 60, you get a full pension. If you retire at the age of what, 55 years or above, but not what, up to 60 or not more than 60, then you get something called a reduced pension. Now, there's a formula they use to calculate this, not to bore you today, but that's what they use. There are some elements that go in there that will be used to determine whether you get a reduced pension or a full pension based on the number of amount of months you contributed, the average of your best three years salary and all of that, right? And then something called a pension right, okay? So that is it for the superannuation pension. The next benefit under tier one is something called an invalidity pension. So this invalidity pension is paid to a member who is totally incapable of earning a living through working as a result of what? Permanent physical or mental disability. So here, someone loses their ability because of what let's say an accident in part of as part of doing their job then they are paid what an invalidity pension but take note here it must have occurred between what in the last 12 months right of what the last 36 months within which the, the accident occurred so so that's for the invalidity pension the person must have now be rendered what incapable of working either physically or mentally and this must be what accompanied with the proof of disability from a certified um, health facility then there's the immigration lump sum this is what paid as a lump sum to non-ghanians who are leaving ghana permanently 
right? They should also be able to prove or provide documentary proof that they are leaving Ghana and they will not return. They'll be paid all their benefits on their way out of Ghana. Survivor's lump sum is paid as a lump sum to a nominated dependent of a member upon his or her death while in service or on pension. So here, in the fortunate events that you die, the person who is nominated as a beneficiary will be given a lump sum payment. However, this will not be paid if you die right after what, the age of 75. So let's say you are on pension, you are still alive, then you are 75, and then you die after 75, right? You do not get survivor's lump sum because I think start an actuarial, actuarial assumption wise, they are saying at 75, you have lived enough, right? So your beneficiary should not come and enjoy any amount here. What do we need to do under the second tier of the occupational pension scheme? The accrued lump sum under the second tier can be used as collateral to secure mortgage for your primary residence. The next is that contributions to the scheme are exempt from tax as well as the income accruing from the investment of the scheme funds are also worth exempt from tax. Next is that a non ghanaian citizen who does not satisfy the qualifying conditions but desires to emigrate permanently from the, from the country may have access to the entire accrued benefits in a lump sum. So when you contribute and you are leaving and you are non ghanaian you get your money when you are going back to your home country. The next is that on the death of a member, the whole of the member's accrued benefit shall be paid as a lump sum to that person's nominated beneficiaries. So that is it for um, the second tier pension scheme. That's all you need to be aware of at a very high level. So take note, this is mandatory, just like what the tier one as well. Now let's talk about the third tier, which is a voluntary provident fund and a personal pension scheme. What must you know under this one? So, under this, the third tier, like I said, it's a voluntary, fully funded, and privately managed scheme. It is supported by tax incentives up to a maximum of 16.5% of the contributor salary to provide additional funds for workers who want to make voluntary contributions to enhance their pension benefits. The next is that well, the minimum age for membership is 15 years, 15 years of age, and it's allowed for a contributor who is more than the statutory retirement age of 60 to be a member. So there's no limit to the age at which you can join what the third tier because it's voluntary. Then a member who has attained the retirement age is entitled to what their accrued benefits in a lump sum. So once you hit pension and you've contributed, we we'll give you your money in a lump sum. Right, that is it for the third tier. Still on the third tier, what do you need to know? Persons in the informal sector who are not covered by the mandatory schemes will have 35% of their declared income exempt from tax for contribution purposes, whilst investment income from investment of scheme funds will also be what tax exempt. So up to 35% of a person's income will have something called a tax benefit. It will not be taxed by reason of what the first, second, and third year combined. Then a withdrawal of all or part of a contributor's accrued benefit on or after retirement will be tax exempt. So if you are able to wait till the retirement age of 60 and you withdraw or you withdraw after 60, then your tier three withdrawals will be what exempt from tax. However, if you do before or you withdraw before, then the amount withdrawn will be subject to a 15% withholding tax, and it's a final tax. So, contributors in the formal sector, it is 10 years. If they withdraw before 10 years and before retirement, then they are going to be subject to what, a 15% final tax. For those in the informal sector, if they withdraw before 5 years and before retirement, then they are what, also going to suffer a um, 15 percent final tax right so that is it formal sector guys have to wait longer to get their money that's 10 years informal sector guys is just five years right and then the tax exemption status for benefits also applies for cases of what incapacity or death that is for the third tier scheme so 
on the third tier scheme, something happened with respect to COVID-19 that I feel I should update you on. So I mentioned this on day one for those who were here. Section 94, subsection 4 of Act 896 has been amended. And this is important to know as you go for your exam this year. In a withdrawal from a provident fund or a personal pension scheme before the retirement age, that is before what you hit 60, by reason of COVID-19, by an employee due to loss of permanent employment, so you've lost your job permanently or, or you've lost your permanent job, or by reason of what a self-employed person who withdraws from their personal savings account provided for under the Pensions Act will be exempt from tax. So if you withdraw your tier 3 and you can prove that it's because of COVID-19 hardships, you lost your job permanently, you lost your permanent job, then that um, withdrawal will be exempt from the 15% tax I mentioned, even though you might have withdrawn before 10 years if you're in the formal sector. For those in the informal sector, the self-employed persons, if they can prove that they are under extreme difficulty, then they withdraw from that tier 3. That withdrawal would not suffer tax at all. So to summarize the three tiers um, scheme in Ghana, we said that the first tier is what a mandatory basic national social security scheme managed by SNIT. The second tier is a mandatory fully funded and privately managed occupational pension scheme. The third tier is a voluntary fully funded and privately managed provident and personal pension scheme. And to summarize, the employer contributes what or the employee contributes 5.5% of their basic salary the employer tops up with a matching contribution of what 13%. Out of this, we are saying that what 5% is paid to what the second tier to manage um, the tier two, and then the amount of 13.5% is paid to SNIT. Out of the 13.5%, what does what happens? SNIT keeps 11% to pay monthly pension, and then they pay 2.5% to the National Health Insurance Authority for the purpose of managing pensions in Ghana. So that should be it for a summary of the three tier um, pension scheme. So to summarize or to, to conclude, the point I want to make is when it comes to this topic, the most important thing you need to be aware of, what you need to arm yourself with is the technical knowledge. These topics are very technical rich. They have a lot of facts and figures here and there. So what I recommend is Make sure you sharpen your skills as you go through different past exam questions on this topic, especially employment income taxation. Take your time, go, make sure you know all the numbers, all the rates, all the rules, all the exemptions. Look at our video that we've um, already uploaded on a past exam question on this area. Take a look at it. It should give you a lot of guidance when it comes to um, employment income taxation. Our plan is to upload another one before you sit your exam, maybe another one or two. Um, so you can take a look at that as well. Um, on, on social security and pensions, if you want a full video, I think there's one that is roughly 20 minutes around. It covers everything back to back. to back. It covers even tier one into a lot more details, the minimum entry age and all of those things, what you need to meet before you can what, enter tier one, tier two, tier three respectively. So um, that should be it for this session, which was supposed to give you a broad overview of the things you need to know these are the things that at the minimum you must know if you are going to pass your exam in this particular area on employment income taxation and the pension and social security scheme in ghana so as always i'm always happy to answer any questions you may have so please leave them in the comments and i'll jump in there and i will respond to you so this has been day two of the crash course series Next time we meet, we are looking at company and business income taxation and advanced income tax concept. Here, I think the best approach we will adopt will be, you know, the question on examination of accounts, um, allowed, disallowed, we'll probably do one of those. And then advanced income tax co concepts are the ones you need to be aware of for sure. Things like um, the concepts around thin capitalization, um things around what repairs and improvement expenditure finance cost limitation among several others so I'll, I'll look at what we need to look at and then most importantly how to answer exam questions around those so that should be it for today i will meet you again 
on day three of our crash course, which will be on Tuesday at 6 p.m. So I'll catch you on Tuesday at 6 p.m. It's been nice having you on a Sunday evening like this. It's good to close early. Um, let's all prepare for the week ahead. Let's all prepare for Monday. So do enjoy the rest of your evening. And I wish you a productive week starting tomorrow. Good evening once again and bye-bye everyone.